All right, it's still good morning, Nigeria, live on the network service of the NTA. And as a prompt for our conversation this morning, let's uh, quickly take a look at this background report put together by Ibrahim Gunda. The Ministry of Interior is revolutionizing activities of agencies under its supervision to align with the President's Renewed Hope agenda. The Nigerian Immigration Service, for instance, saw the introduction of reforms for international passport to eliminate corruption and promote convenience. Others are investment in technology and innovation to reduce bottleneck, hindering passport processing and enhancing national security, among others. The Minister of Interior's biggest imprint is in border management, leading to introduction of e-gates at airports and e-borders at national borders. The Nigerian Correctional Service witnessed cases of jailbreak and challenges of feeding inmates, as well as congestion, prompting ongoing renovation of some correctional facilities as well as improvement in feeding of inmates, among others. The Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps and Nigerian Fire Service also witnessed a new approach in protecting national assets. Specialized focus on preventing pipeline vandalism and safe school initiative. What is the level of implementation of these reforms? What is the future plan and how impactful has it been? These and more will be some of the questions guests on Good Morning Nigeria will find answers to on the program. All right, many thanks, uh, Ibrahim Bey Logunda, for that background report. And to begin our conversation, let me introduce here in the studio, and uh, for the second time, Dr. Olubomi Tunjojo, Minister of Interior. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Let me also introduce Kemi Nana Nandap, Comptroller General, Nigeria Immigration Service. Perhaps the fourth uh, female Comptroller General of the Nigeria Immigration Service. I, I remember the Honorable Minister saying that women in the service would no longer complain because we've had a succession of women now. True. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. Honorable Minister, let's... Uh, Before we begin the conversation, oh, Director... I'm sorry. Um, and she's just and, here. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Dr. Uju Agomo, the Executive Director of Prisoners Rehabilitation and Welfare Action Power. Many thanks for joining us, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you indeed for having me. All right. Uh, it's also important to mention that she's a member of the United Nations Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, Associate Professor of uh, Criminology and Security Studies, Christian University, Abiy Okuta. Many Thank thanks you. once again, ma'am, for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, now begin. Honorable Minister, it's been a year a year plus um, of working in the Ministry of Interior. What have been your biggest achievements, you would say, and uh, along the line, what have been the major challenges? Of course, how easy you've come with unconventional ways of doing things, new ways of doing it. How easy has it been to drive your vision you know, into your team to get the results that you have achieved? Thank you very much, um, and it's nice seeing you again. Uh, let me say this very clearly, that um, being Minister of Interior um, under the able leadership of President Bola Ahmed Tinobo has been very interesting, and interesting in a sense of the fact that we have a president who gives that free hand for you to work. I mean, the free hand that allows you to be creative, that allows you to be innovative, and that allows you to be able to implement key reforms, you know. And, um, and I'll tell you that the biggest achievement for me is being the fact that we've been able to, um, that the Renewed Hope agenda of the president has been, uh, we've been able to encourage it in terms of our workings in the Ministry of Interior and our agencies. Do not forget that the Ministry of Interior deals with all Nigerians, you know, because it, border management, border control, this has, these are issues that deals with Nigerians. And do not also forget that um, um, correctional service reform is also very key in terms of our justice system, you know. And, um, and of course, the Nigerian Civil uh, Security and Civil Defense Corps is also at the heart of the entrenchment of internal security mechanisms, especially critical national assets, and um, of course, and also the Federal Fire Service. So, basically, the ministry deals with everyday Nigerians, deals with the yearnings of Nigerians. And I'll tell you that uh, uh, in the last one year, 
uh, God has helped us, you know, with the support of Mr. President, to be able to achieve almost all the things that we highlighted, uh, that we planned to do within the first 12 months, you know, in office. And also, we've been so lucky to be able to have very wonderful uh, officers, you know, working with us and, of course, core professionals. I'll tell you, for instance, in the issue of the correctional service, um, with, which is an area where we had a lot of issues, you know, because I think the problems there, uh, I mean, very endemic, I mean, it's been there for so many years. But with the committee that we've been able to set up, and Dr. Uju, who is on the United Nations list as one of the um, one of the brains behind correctional cyber reforms all over the world has graciously accepted to be the secretary of the committee and we've been able to 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 bring the best of minds you know together to be able small committee because we don't want a, a big committee we don't want a large system such that control becomes impossible you know we want people that will be able to technical professional people that will be able to give us results because we want uh, so just as we've been able to solve the passport problem once and for all you know we want to be able to solve the correctional issues once and for all so that it's not about building strong individuals, it's about building strong institutions. So that even if tomorrow I'm not here in interior, even if after President Balak met Tinubu's administration, by the grace of God, the correctional service will have been put on the right track, you know, of performance. So that's part of what we're doing. So basically, to answer your question, I think that our biggest uh, our biggest uh, achievement so far is being able to build strong institutions, you know, across board, you know, because that's what is important. In the Nigerian Immigration Service, on the 1st of November, the uh, contactless passport, biometric passport application system goes live. We'll start in Canada, you know, because we're starting with Canada on the 1st, you know. Then on the 15th, we'll be able to go to the UK, the US, and uh, Italy. You know, then on uh, the 1st of December, it goes live everywhere even in Nigeria. So it means that the era when you need to even go to immigration office for biometric capture or whatever, you have to cancel a day's job, you have to inconvenience yourself, leave Abuja, uh, central area or Garuki to Soka, or you are in London, I mean, you are in Overhampton or in Birmingham, you have to travel to London, you are in Vancouver, you have to fly us to get to Ottawa. How does the, I mean, those days of inconveniences are gone. Because I always tell people, this is 2024. This is not 1904. This is 2024, the era of technology. So those era, finally, you know, that which to me is like the last stage of our passport reform system. You know, don't forget that when we started, we cleared the backlog. That was the first one, to over 200,000. We said, okay, let's clear that. That's the short term, you know. Then the midterm was to bring integrity into our passport and travel document which was what led us to the PKI, the PKD, you know, where Nigerian uh, passport security is now, our passport security is now uploaded on the global directory of ICAO all over the world. So it means that that travel document of Nigeria can be verified, can be authenticated anywhere in the world. So the security feature you see in an American passport, the security feature you see in a Canadian passport, the security feature you see in the Chinese passport is what you get in a Nigerian passport. So we've been able to be able to build that level of, of trust of the global community, you know, in terms of our passport system. And of course, working through the chain automating the whole application process. And the final stage for us is especially those in diaspora, you need to see the pain. So now, by November 1, that, that ends. So we know that, OK, even beyond President Balag Metinubu's administration, the passport system has come to stay. It is that kind of mentality, that kind of vision that we have for the correctional center. Mm. So that by the time we by the time we're done with the correctional centers, no matter who comes as CG, no matter who comes as minister, no matter who comes as president in the future, we will know that we have a system that, that can, that can uh, that can withstand, you know, any government. So basically, it's about building strong institutions. So to, to wrap it up, I'll say this. Um, our biggest achievement has been, obviously, building strong institutions in line with the Green Hope agenda of uh, Mr. President. And of course, you asked about the issue 
and uh, I mean the biggest challenge. And I'll tell you, there is. I've not really had too much of a challenge, and I'll tell you why. Because, with all due respect, I have a president who supports innovation. I mean, all you need to do is to tell him this is the you know this is what you want to do, and he gives you ideas. You know, he he balances your your views. He 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 loves to engage. He engages you intellectually, like what some people call intellectual intercourse. You know, he likes to have that argument with you. He, he discusses with you, and once you're speaking science, the president gives you the nod to go ahead. And once you go ahead, he protects you. You know, making sure you are doing the right thing. Oh. So we have been so fortunate. I say that so because of that i wouldn't be able to say oh this has been a challenge or this has not been a challenge it's about thinking of the idea conceiving the idea nurturing the idea and implementing the idea and making sure the idea works for the people thank you very much uh, honorable minister for your opening comments uh, indeed you have spoken well and we see the work that you've been doing uh, in your ministry uh, you talked about building strong institutions and you know that's um, one aspect Nigerians really, you know, would want to see, uh, you know, just not just in the ministry, but of course across the uh, board. But let's be specific now. You talked about the correctional services, uh, you know, specifically building strong institutions and you know making a correctional service um, what it should be like. Um, I, I, uh, there's an investigation that uh, reveals that um, in the last three years um, we've had um, more jailbreaks than ever. In fact, the Senate President. Uh, said uh, with a change of name that there have been more jail breaks than when it was a Nigeria prison service. And the reports reveals that about 6,000 inmates have escaped, you know, in the course of the series of jail breaks we've had in the country. Uh, only about 1,000 have been recaptured, meaning that over 5,000 are still on the run. I want to know, in terms of building strong institutions, what exactly are you doing about the correctional service in specifics now? And then what is the plan about recapturing or you know, those inmates who are on the run at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know the source of your data, and I will be very specific on that, uh, because I know um, since President Balak Metinubu came on board in 2023, we've had only two, to the best of my knowledge. And those two were due to forces beyond the control of... Um, of the service as at that part at those particular points in time. Number one was the one that happened in Suleja. And the Suleja was due to force major. I mean the wall, you know, came down because that correctional center was actually built, I think if I'm not wrong, I think it was nineteen fourteen. Yes, the correctional center was built in nineteen fourteen. And I tell you this, and I'm I am a man that do not I'm, I'm I, I, I I see my mind at every point in time. I'm an objective person. President Bola Metinbu did not become president in nineteen fourteen, you know, and he became president probably a uh, hundred and a uh, hundred and uh, nine years after when that particular correctional center was built. So the problems that was due to issue of wind and whatever the wall came down and etc and the second one was the one that happened in Meduguri, which was due to the flood and i tell you i was there myself the next day it happened i was there and i saw the level of the flood and of course uh, you you need to be there i mean that could happen anywhere in the world that's the truth because we saw a flood that was over all the structures not just the correctional center the level of the flood was even beyond it was beyond human height level and so that was an issue was a force major we've not had jail attacks there's a difference between a jail attack and a jail break there are two different things so if you're talking about i don't want us to mix data you understand what I mean? It's very key that we understand it, that under this government, we've done our best. There's so many strategies we've used, I cannot say here, in terms of managing um, the whole issues of uh, jail attack, jail break, and, and it has worked so far with co uh, cooperation from the DSS, from the Nigerian Army, from civil defense, from immigration, and a lot. We hold meetings Saturdays, Sundays, Sundays we go to the office just to strategize when we have alerts and we do a lot of things behind the scenes. So we have been able to handle that. So when they talk about, oh, as if it has never been as worse as this, no, that's not true. Let us be objective for once. So, that's not about that. And when you speak about capturing people, 
I, I, as much as I do not like to, to, to you know, I, I must say this very clearly. When we came on board, there was this program we saw that they called uh, Correctional Information Management System. And we realized that this is a rough technology. When the whole issue happened in uh, Suleja, we realized that a lot of these people, you know, we had problems. We had to work like a week or two weeks extra to be able to get the data of these people. I mean, their biometrics and etc. We had to go get the paper, uh, NIMSI, we had to go to NIMSI, uh, uh, the, what's it called, to the bank, to uh, the FR, road safety, a lot of, just to get data of these people. Within that time, it's easy, it, I mean, some of these SKPs could have as well, you know, um, escaped and what I immediately what we did is that, listen, there is no, there is no crime in making mistake. But the issue is never make the mistake a habit. Don't ever let it repeat itself. And we looked around the whole system and what this government has been able to do. And that is why you saw the difference in terms of the response time in Meduguri and uh, Suleja, the two different things. In Meduguri, in Suleja, it took us a couple of days, you know, like a week or so to come out on whatever with data and information, information sharing. But in, when it happened in Meduguri, within 24 hours, we were able, within 24 hours, we were able to share information, data, biometric, pictures, details, and everything with all other sister agencies, you know. And that has led us to the recapture of a lot of people. I, can, I, don't know, I can't tell you the exact number as I sit now, you know, but a lot of people had been recaptured, you know, because, inform because we have, we've operationalized the information management system. And I, as I tell you today, there is no inmate, either you're a waiting trial or wh whatever, that is not enrolled on our system. So we have a robust technological solution now. You know, before it was with what we saw, uh, I mean, proud to now, what we had proud to this time was more in name, you know. But we've been able to operationalize it. We've been able to constantly update it. And as I tell you, it's real time. So building on this, leveraging on the foundation that we have built now, it means that we can, always, we can only get better. So as I said, you see, Niger every nation is an evolving entity. We have to always understand that, you know. You do not expect Eldorado overnight. You know, it's the same thing in correctional, it's the same thing in Nigerian immigration service, it's the same thing in fire service or any other agency of government, you know. Even America is still evolving, you know. In the United Kingdom is still evolving. But the bottom line is we should be honest enough to admit our mistakes when we make mistakes and be, and be bold and audacious enough to be able to correct these mistakes and make sure that these mistakes do not turn to habit, which is what this government is doing. So in the real sense of it, I want to assure you that on the issue of recapturing, on the issue of the lot that is going on with that regard, and also uh, this uh, committee, you know, headed by the permanent secretary, of which Dr. Uju is the secretary, is going to bring us lasting solutions to a lot of these issues, you know, issue of overcrowding, the congestions, even welfare of of uh, uh, inmates, um, relocation of prisons, of correctional centers that be eaten up by urbanization, and a lot of issues. It's going to be an all-encompassing one. The public, there's going to be. I think she was. Just, she told me this morning that I think by by December they will bring out the first. Uh, uh, public hearing, you know, to get opinions of people and be able to come up with a robust plan. And with what this government has done in immigration service and what we've done, even with the correctional service, you Nigerians can trust this government that when we say, when we put our hand on the plow, there is no going back. All right. All right, Minister, thank you very much. You will agree that on set we are outnumbered by the women. So before they come for my head, let, let, let me get to the Controller General of Immigration. Now, now, a lot of what the Ministry of Interior in this administration has achieved uh, rests in the Nigerian Immigration Service. And I talk uh, with reference to the e-borders, the uh, e-gates, the passport reforms, and all of it. But the feelers, and this is the opinion of many 
that there is resistance to you know going contactless resistance to you know limiting human contact of course because it doesn't um, favor certain people down the line how are you dealing with this to ensure that everybody falls in line with the vision of the minister and of course yours which i know is not uh, different from his how are you dealing with this to ensure that you achieve uh, the best results uh, that you possibly can in this regard thank you very much um first of all let me say that that opinion was before not what is obtainable now this is because um any system, no matter what kind of system it is, if you do not understand it, if you don't know what it's all about, it's usually, you know, it's obvious that there'll be resistance or there'll be confusion. So that's what we've tried to understand and explain. We've done a lot of engagement with our officers. We've done a lot of sensitization. We've done a lot of training. Right now, we're even training. We've trained over 250 officers regarding this new deployment of technology that we've done and also even the passport uh, um, uh, innovations we've done. So a lot depends on training and retraining, which is what we're doing presently. And uh, the officers know that it's the benefit of not just Nigerians, but also ourselves as well, because it makes our job easier. It makes verification easier. It makes you, you know, our job, it takes us to another level. And they are all very eager and willing to work with this. So I think that was before we started the you know, the sensitization and the, you know, the advocacy to them. And a lot of training has gone into that, and I think everyone is on board. Fantastic. Mm. Uh, CG, um, uh, kudos. You know, a lot of Nigerians are excited about the reforms in the Thank immigration you. service. But, of course, uh, one issue that is um, uh, putting a lot of strain in the pockets of Nigerians will be the price of uh, the passport. Uh, September, you increased the price of... Uh, the passport, the 32 page from uh, 35,000 to 50,000, mm -hmm. and uh, the 64 pages was increased from 75,000 to 100,000. There, okay. So, um, I, I know that I did see a report you know, <coughs> from the immigration service as to why the increase had, had to be done, but I mean, considering the, the present economic realities, a lot of Nigerians are saying, Well, this is this is above what it can afford. Um, what, what's your take, really, about why there should be an increase in the price at this time? Thank you very much. Um, passport production is dollar-denominated. We don't produce it in Nigeria. We bring it from outside the country. So everything we do is based on the dollar rate. And as it is now, we pay taxes, which is what we do for Nigerians. And as an institution, I don't think it's right for us to pay taxes for people. So what we're saying is, listen, this price is what we started with over, what, 15, 16 years ago, when the dollar rate was, what, two, three hundred or 400? And it's the same rate we're still keeping as at now that the dollar is about 1,600. So as it is, we are supplementing. We are, you know, using our own money to pay for all the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the booklets we're buying and everything. So it's not as if... We're insensitive to Nigerians. It's just that it's not sustainable. It well, is, is there a limitation at the moment as to why the passports cannot be produced in Nigeria, just so that you know this dollar uh, issue would would be taken like out of the, the minister matter? said. This is what we're trying to do in terms of uh, institutionalizing, you know, uh, uh, institutions in Nigeria, and also building infrastructures. That's one of the things we're trying to do as well. It's a work in progress. Right now, we're also doing our personalization structure in the service uh, headquarters. So a lot of things are being done in terms of how we can domesticate production of passport booklets. But it's not something that can happen overnight. It has to be a process, a procedure, which, of course, the, the, you know, this administration has been gracious enough to look into. We've had lots of people coming back and forth. We've been going in terms of how do we domesticate this issue. And uh, it's a oh, work in right. progress. I, I had wanted to, but since we are still on the passport issue, before we get to reforms uh, in the correctional service, the, the CG did say, well, it's an old, it's a price that has been there for quite a while. But I do know that um, in the last one year, we've had, you know, the cost of passport increase from 25 to 35 and then to 50. Uh, it, given the circumstance, yes, high explanation is noted, but given the circumstance, 
is this justifiable, though, given the circumstances that Nigerians have found themselves at this time? Well, thank you so much. Let me say this very clearly. There are certain things I sincerely believe are not meant to be subsidized. Personal opinion, not as Minister of Interior. Please, let's get this straight. I'm speaking as Bumitun Jojo now. I sincerely think that as a country, we can't be subsidizing passport. What can we do is to create options that, okay, if you want to travel and you're not traveling abroad, and you want to travel within ECOWAS, within ECOWAS sub-region, mm -hmm. there should be a cheaper alternative, you know, because it might not really make sense that if you're not, if your aim is not to go to Europe, to go to um, Asia, East Africa, or whatever, if you're just maybe you're moving from Nigeria to Niger, um, to um, Niger, or you're moving from Nigeria, you know, Ghana. to Ghana and etc. There should be a cheaper alternative, you know. And what did we do? That's the ECOWAS card. And you need to look, get to immigration office. We have about a two or three story building completed, all facilities installed, and the ECOWAS card is, I mean, it's going to be available at an extremely cheaper rate. Because the simple truth is, as CG rightly said, passport is dollar denominated. That's the truth. And when you look, I don't like to compare Nigeria with other countries. It might not be what I really like to do, but when you look at it realistically, you will realize that just do a just do a Google search. You will realize that Nigeria has arguably one of the cheapest passports <laughs> in the world. I'm telling you. Even in Africa, Google it. Anywhere in the world, Nigerian passport is still one of because we're very considerate. Immigration is not making profit. We don't see passport as a profit-making venture. But the scenario whereby we import passport, why must government be subsidizing passport? I don't think that is right. And when you speak about production, that why are we not producing the book? Get it straight. We personalize here. What we are talking about is the production of the raw booklet. That's what we're talking about because before, because I've always had people misconceive that. A lot of people, there's a lot of misconceptions. Say, oh, Nigerian passport is printed. Up. There's a difference between passport production and passport personalization. The production of the raw booklet is just like a, it's like book, you know, that it doesn't carry anything until it is personalized. The production, it's not only Nigeria. For now, we have to look at cost-benefit analysis. What is the cost of producing in Nigeria at the moment, and what is the cost of importing? Can we, at this time, it's not what we can achieve. The domestication is not what we can achieve in six months. That's the truth. Uh, it's not what is readily that it can be achieved within six months. It's a process. And we are actually, at the moment, going through that. Uh, but, but are you uh, willing to give us a timeline? No, I wouldn't be able, because... I, I, I wouldn't be specific because I will tell you why. When I give my word, I try to keep it, you know, because that's what, the, that's what this government is about. We will never promise you what we will not do, and we will never give you a timeline that will be impossible to achieve. But the simple truth is that a lot of countries, even, in the, even, the, even UK itself, does UK produces its booklet? Ask, you can Google it. You have to ask how many of even the developed countries even produce their booklets because you know so it's not it's something that we have to look at the economics behind it and look at the comparative advantage job creation uh, national pride and we weigh the you know and once we do that we now roll out our domestication plan you know to say okay, okay. in the short term this is what we we'll do in the long term this is what we we'll do so when we we're, we're done with that then we'll come back to Nigeria but what I want to assure you I don't think this is what we should even really be talking so much about because immigration service has been very, very reasonable in terms of how much the passport goes for now. The price of, you know, everything is, I mean, there is a bit of inflation, mm -hmm. you know, across board. And we cannot expect government, you know, to, to, to be subsidizing passports. And what, how many people? We produce about 2 million passports a year. That is two out of 200 and something million people. So my own question as a Nigerian, not as Minister of Interior, let's get this straight. As a Nigerian now, because I'm talking in my capacity as a Nigerian now, not as Minister. If we produce two million passports for out of 200 and something million people, that is 0.5%. So why must government, when I became Minister of Interior, I inherited debt of over 20 something billion in passports. 
and we've been trying to pay, we've been trying, because they, we were on, I mean, the money we were getting from Passport was lower, oh, was lesser than even the production cost. So how can government be subsidizing to the tune of about 40, 50 billion a year for 0.5 percent, you know, right. of the population. I don't think that is right. Thank you. Thank you I so think much. if that sort of expenditure will come on, on on the part of government, that sort of expenditure can go into education, as mm. Mr. President will tell you. That can go into health care. That can go into issues that will affect the average and Nigeria. all Nigerians, not to subsidize over 50 billion. So what we are doing now is that we're not making profit. But what we are saying is we're not here, I mean, not that we're not, I won't just use the word we're not making profit, because I know there are fact checkers, people that will go and check and now, pa, 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 and say, you know, I'm not checking you there. Uh, I'm not saying we're not, but what I'm saying is that even the headroom that we put is in case if tomorrow there is slight increase in uh, so that we are not, we are not coming back again to so say we are increasing right, almost thank you. Hon Honorable Minister, I will to you. We'll pause you here. Let's get to Dr. Agomo now and talk about the correctional service. We know that's your uh, core area. Um, you know, the Honorable Minister was speaking a while ago and talked about inflation. Uh, and when you talk about inflation, of course, food prices a uh, number one hit in all of that. Uh, we know that the federal government recently increased the uh, amount uh, spent to feed inmates from 750 naira to 1,250 naira just recently. A lot of people say that's inadequate. Um, and there are reports here and there. I, I read a report recently uh, that says that um, some inmates are, um, um, are malnourished, uh, some are dying as a result of starvation. Um, there's also, there are also reports about uh, maltreatment uh, within the correctional service. I want you to tell me if these facts are true, because, I mean, not every one of us has the access into the correctional facility to know what goes on in there. But these are the reports that we have, uh, that uh, there's also the issue of maltreatment resulting in deaths of inmates and all of that. And then the worrisome one is the fact that when inmates uh, pass on, that their relatives are not... Uh, uh, consulted or rather they don't give consent for the bearer and they go ahead to bear and all of that. So I want you to tell us the state of the correctional facilities that we have in this country. Are these facts, are these um, um, reports accurate? What is the treatment like for an inmate in the Nigeria Correctional Service today? Okay, thank you very much. There's quite um, a whole lot of issues that you've brought to the table. I, I think the first thing I would like to say it's as in, so that I don't, um, we don't miss it, was the very first point you started discussing with the Honorable Minister in terms of security. And all I would add to the points that the Honorable Minister made is that as a people, we need to be really intentional in terms of implementing our laws. Okay? So sometimes you have very, very important, very, very progressive, very, very innovative provisions in the laws, just like what you have in the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019. But implementation, full implementation becomes a challenge. So in terms of dealing with the issue of, as, yeah, around issue of security in terms of correctional service, what I would recommend is that we try to have effective implementation of Section 28 of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act 2019, both subsection 1 to 3. And that is very detailed in terms of what needs to happen in relation to the different classification of correctional centers. It's very key, okay? And uh, part of that is also all of the major things that the Honorable Minister mentioned. So I would use that to loop into the questions that you asked. And I think that fundamentally, the major problem is that people do not fully understand the persons, the kind of people who are in custody. And I think if we do, our response to what we, how we get people into custody and the duration they stay in custody becomes different. So first is to, and I always try to make sure that I make this point any time I have opportunity to speak, is to understand that there are people who are in custody um, who are innocent. There are people who are there who are minor offenders. There are people who are there who are serious offenders. The reason is that a lot of the burden that you have within the custodial center is all has to do with the population too. So being able to understand that when you are locking 
persons more than what the designated capacity of that facility is. It becomes challenge. If there is a challenge in terms of the infrastructure in those places, there is challenge in terms of the time that you can give due attention to proper treatment and processing of the correctional the inmates within those correctional centers. So I will take the issues one by one. You raise the issue of food. We just finished talking about inflation. So if you think about what amount of food and what they call gas, which is basically the uh, wood and gas that they use in cooking, that 1,250 would have purchased or 1,700 and something would have purchased. I need us to also factor into this the fact that there is a business dimension to it because there are contractors who win the awards. Mm. Now, when you now know that there are contractors, you begin to ask yourself, what will be the margin of profit for the contractor? So, at the initial, the amount is not sufficient. You know, just take to 1,250 and ask yourself how much of this can feed you for the whole of the day. Okay? Now, you will now ask yourself when you put the margin of the contractors. But the major question is also to understand that there needs to be checks. What is the process itself? So, the whole onboarding of that process becomes challenging. And let me ask you. When you look at food, the basic thing you would need is that if you can produce what you eat, it becomes very helpful. Mm. A lot of countries are trying, making sure that they are becoming full subsistence within the correctional center. And I'll give you two examples. For example, in Zambia, all of the vegetables that are fed that inmates in Zambia eat are produced by the inmates in Zambia. Maize meal, which is another staple food, you know, that they use. At the time I had went to assess the correctional centers in, in that country, I found that, that at that point, there were already 85% substance on maize meal. In Nigeria, we have farm centers. The question is, how can we radicalize what we have to ensure that we begin to produce what we feed? That's one level. And then also the other issues about oversight, to ensure that the quality, the nutritional value, mm. the quality and the size is the quantity and the quality of food is adequate for the funds that are also being kept there. So you need to completely reform the whole process. So yes, there are inmates that die. And as a I, result of malnutrition? For different reasons. And I give you a very simple example. And this is, I mean, I don't know whether you are aware that Prawa is going to be 30 years this year. And so I'm going to give you some history that so it's to tell you that it just didn't just start now. I recall several years back, and this I am talking about more than 15 years or 20 years ago, there was a time that inmates were dying like this, especially in the medium security correctional centers. I became curious. So we did an analysis of all of the deaths. So we found out that the deaths were happening like a lot, five, five days, and then they would drop. It looks like it stabilizes, and it happens again. And when we did analysis, we found out that a lot of the deaths were happening during the rainy season. This was a long time ago. So what happened, we became very worried. And we realized that they felt at that point, because they started realizing that they were not having enough intake of proteins. So the uh, welfare officer, God bless her, so she's dead now, Mrs. Bridget Opia in Medium, began to call religious bodies to begin to bring soya beans. So soya beans were now turned into soya beans drinks. You know, they found out that those who were in the sick bay were being given and they were getting wet, but the other ones, in the, that were in the south were now getting sick. sick. So they now made sure that the soya bean drink was being given to every of the inmates. That model was discussed with cook warders who came for a training in the a, a, a training institution there at that time, later on. And we found out that they started doing this in different parts of the country. One day, one of them saw me in one of the correctional centers in the southeast, and he said to me that he went back after that training and started adding soya beans into the uh, soup that they were eating. And that brought down the death, death rate. rate. So what we realized that because of the rainy season, because the damp cells became damp, so again, there is a need for checks and balances. You need to also be able to analyze it like the Honorable Minister said when he was talking. That's also part of the thing that we need to be looked at. But again, you remember that I had said something about population. Correctional Center is really there to be able to check everything that you see. Part of what triggers it is from from the beginning, from the police, law enforcement, to the judiciary, and down. And that was why I took time to explain to you the three categories of persons. So when you see people who have no reason being in custody, what it then means, why are they there? 
because of course that population has implication in the food on the food but the point is that if an innocent person is kept in custody one hour there can make the person to form get you know more contact with criminal um uh, more criminalized individuals that will actually put the person back into a more dangerous pathway going forward so you see that connection those who are minor offenders why are they there when you have a whole part two of the nigerian correctional uh, act of 2019 talking about non-custodial measures so we have to be intentional in terms of how we truly ensure that we is only using custodial center as a very last result so the judiciary the law enforcement agencies must do the need for because what they are doing is actually affecting the security of the country if the correctional facility is overburdened by and that's one thing we know when you talk about population people need to understand what kind of population the bulk of the people there over 70 percent are those who have not been convicted and when the, an inmate is not convicted the very test is wants to go to court so there's a lot of transactional things that happen it's very difficult to actually provide proper regime structure within the custodial center, center. Okay. there are a whole section of section 10 of the nigerian correctional service out of 2019 that tells you exactly what needs to be done day to day risk assessments of every inmate that comes in from the day one they come in you have a the needs and risk assessment and plan the regime of that person including where the person is staying in custody along the risk that that person portrays so why does it seem that this nigerian correctional service act of 2019 you know, it's impossible to implement because 2019 is five years now. Yes. Why is it not implementable? It, that is the challenge. And I believe that if we can be intentional on this, it will go a long way. Part of that is also about the, you know, the will. Look at the non-custodial measures. You know, I think that this is one of the best things the country could do for itself. Because once you said, you know, strengthen that, and from what I have heard, unless I'm, I stand to be corrected, there is no funding that has gone to the non implementation of non-custodial measures. But meanwhile, non-custodial measures implementation is something that should make everyone happy because it will help to save costs. It will help to make the community safer. And you may ask me why and how. Remember that if somebody has been put in custody and the court says you are leaving in three years or whatever, of course, when they calculate the remission, you are going to be left slightly uh, earlier than the three, three calendar year. Yeah? But the point here is that even if the custodial officer find out that you yourself you, are, you, are, you have not been reformed. You are going to go back and cause problems. They can't stop you. They will open the date to go for you to go because that is what the court have decided that you have finished your term. So technically, the correctional center is not correcting people. No, the but the point I'm, there's a point I'm trying to make here. The point I'm trying to make here is that by looping in the non-custodial officers, it means that in the community, so you, you, you play three roles. First, the non-custodial officer can also begin, and that's another issue that can also be discussed, is they also begin to take a role whereby you look at signs that can prevent offending. You don't wait for the offending to come. So you see people who are drop out of school, people who are using drugs or whatever. So you do whatever you need to do, uh, families of people who are in, 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 in custodial centers, to be able to bring certain certainty to prevent. Mm. Secondly, when the person is not in custody, the people in custody will take care, isn't it? When the person comes out, the non-custodial officer follows through. But bear, bear, bear in mind that if, for example, the person has found to be the kind of person that will benefit from non-custodial application, non-custodial measures, as stated under Section 37 sub 1 of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act, whether it's community service, whether it's probation, whether it's uh, parole, whether it's restorative justice and all the rest of them, all of those with the exception of parole will be supposed to be people who have not entered the custodial center. But what that means is that by effectively in supporting this, when the person has been released, somebody's providing right, supervision. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Agumo. I, I'll pause you. I have more questions for you, you know, about the custodial center. But let me get to the Honorable Minister now, because uh, Dr. Agumo has talked about the issue of overcrowding. i quickly read out the statistics to you. As at September 3rd, uh, the statistics shows that we have 82,831 males, 1,920 females in our correctional facilities. Uh, uh, 57,750 are awaiting trials, uh, while we have 21,900 convicted and uh, 1,501 life sentences. This is according to statistics. I want to quote you. In June, you said uh, that uh, this is specifically now to Kefi Medium Security Custodial Center. You said that there were 750 inmates at that center, uh, which has the capacity to hold just 340 inmates. 
Now, out of the 750 inmates, 605 are awaiting trial. I, I want to know. She has said that that's the reason why feeding is insufficient, why maltreatment is high, why, I mean, so many factors. And of course, w some of these people eventually come out of society again, come out of society again, and they cause more problems because of all these um, um, issues they have faced in the custodial centers. What exactly is the ministry doing? I agree that it's not totally, you know, it doesn't rest with the Ministry of Interior or the custodial centers alone. Of course, judiciary has a role to play. But what are you doing, considering the fact that you're the ones handling these people and bearing the brunt of, uh, you know, the whole situation? Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me say this very clearly. Um, is there a problem? Yes, there is a problem. And do we accept that uh, there are issues? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. And the question now is, um, are we ready to make the necessary reforms? Yes, that's what exactly we're doing. Um, these problems were inherited. But as I say, as we say, government is in continuum. You know, you in, like the president always says, you inherit assets. <laughs> You inherit liabilities. liabilities. I mean, that's what government is about. But for for us to sit here and say there's just going to be like a magic wand, it's not going to happen. It's a process, okay? And that's why when we came on board, you realize that we decongested and we, that figure, we reduced it by 5%, you know, by virtue of raising funds through the private sector of um, for... Offenders, you know, fines and uh, penalties. We're able to do that, and we reduce that by about five percent. And by doing that, we save government of about one billion naira annually in terms feeding. of feeding. Okay, we're able to do that. But we understood from day one that that was like, uh, like a short-term thing. You know, we must. That's not a sustainable thing. It's not what we can be doing every now. And then we have to talk about the institution, building a bigger institution, a better, a more solid institution. And that's what we're doing. And that's what led us to the committee that was set up. And we want to take our time. We are pending when the, the decision of the committee will, will, will come to reality. Will, there will be fruition of the effort. We are we're obviously we're doing our uh, audits. We're, putting our officers in check and we're making sure that we're renovating correctional centers. A lot of, if you get to Kuji Correctional Center, you will see the difference. Even if you go to uh, uh, the one in Nasarawa, uh, Kefi, you'll see there are so many other places we're doing a lot of renovations, at least facelift and to give our people better facilities, better conditions in the correctional center. There's a lot we're doing in that regard. But as we said, that is not the main solution. The main solution is to set up and look at the core issues. What are the issues? What are the factors? I personally believe that non-custodial measure is at the center of our solution. I personally believe that. For instance, I'll give you an example. When you look at it, you see that about 70% or above are awaiting trials. You know, and for me, and out of that 70 something percent, I tell you, more than 60 percent are non violent awaiting trials. So, I personally do not understand why a non violent awaiting trial, maybe for loitering, for you know, small, small, small offenses, traffic, uh, different offenses, small, small things, you know, you lock them in Kuji prison, you know, pending when you know, I sincerely think that if we have non custodial. Uh, measures, you know, those people that are still awaiting trial and are non-violent, you know, sh will not be locked up with um, hardened criminals, you know, where somebody goes, and that's why you, that's the reason why you see the rate of recidivism is so high. You understand that people go into correctional center today for stealing yam, you know, the next time he goes into correctional center is for stealing car. The next time he goes after that, he's for carrying gone. The next one is terrorism. You know, so people get hardened more and more when they go because we have to build a correctional system that is correctional, that is transformational, and of course that is rehabilitatory. Those are the things that we must look at. So in designing this, the non-custodial is at the center of it because do not forget that the different one one of the different the main difference between the prison service act and the correctional service act is this issue of non custodial and it's the the the, the, the importation of 
of the non-custodial is what has changed the name for prisons, which is a place of incarceration to correctional, a place of transformation and rehabilitation, a place of hope, a place where someone can actually go and get better. So we must now sit down and look at this non-custodial, you know, and I have told Nigeria Correctional Service that in their 2025 budget, the, 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 the idea of not putting any line, budget line in uh, on, for non-custodial is not going to work for me because uh, we realized that when I came on board, we've seen all their budgets since 2019. I don't think they've ever you know, provided f a, a funding line, oh, you by know, themselves. And by themselves. And the simple truth is, if government says, submit your budget proposal, it is what you submit to government. You're supposed to do your needs assessment. Mm -hmm. To be, it's not the president that will come and do your needs assessment. As an agency, you do your needs assessment, you submit it to government. Upon that, the government looks at it justify, justifiably, sends it to National Assembly for the appropriation process. So I have given that instruction already that for 2025 budget, that non custodial must be given reasonable allocation of resources because that is the way forward okay that is because when these correctional centers were built the quest the question we should ask ourselves is how what what was the plan you know these correctional centers were built probably to to take about 40,000 people also today we have 80 something thousand people so there's overcrowding. You need to get to uh, Ikoi in Lagos. You need to see. You know. You need to get to Port Harcourt. So, but the simple truth is, these are structures. These are not policies. If it's a policy, you can issue policy overnight. But structures. If you want to build a real correctional center that will accommodate the two thousand and something people in uh, Port Harcourt, it's going to take you how many months? More than a year. Roughly two years of solid work. So you why are to be the, able to do that? Why, why so are that is capacity is not working because no, the critical don't, capacities don't, have been on ground for no, quite don't a while. Say, don't say that. You see, Victor, I will, I will advise that we fact check, all right, before we make certain assertions. The, 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 the 3,000 capacity, to the best of my knowledge, the only one that's been completed is the one in Kano. I'm aware. And and yes, why is it it's moving? only the Kano that is, that is actually, and it's actually working. I was there. I was in Kano earlier this year. I saw it. People, office, uh, people are there. And of course, the other ones are, but what I'm even telling you is that even before us, as a, before we as a country sit down and start thinking of incarceration as a first resort, nobody does that. Incarceration is supposed to be the last resort. Yeah, right. So the major thing in our, in our review system, in our reform system, is for us to be able to sit down and say, hey, what is our transformation? What's our correction? What's our rehabilitation plan? At the end of that rehabilitation plan is incarceration, not at the beginning. And that is the reform. That's what we're trying to do within the next one year. So what, we, what I just want to tell you is that we are focused. We know what we need to do. We know what we have to do to be able to handle some of this. And we cannot do it just as Ministry of Interior. We have to work with Ministry of Justice. We have to work with the police. We have to work with our judiciary. We have to work with all the uh, government agencies and organs. I, I was going to come there because I know that even if you build 10,000 capacity in all the geopolitical that zones. That is my problem. Hold on, Victor. Hold on. Says, hold on. Hold on. Hold on, Victor. Victor. Hold, hold on, Victor. That is exactly what I am saying. You're still repeating what I... I'm not comfortable with you repeating. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Just let's, let's pause I need to land on this let's, let's point. Just, just a moment. Just, just a second. Just, just, just a second. Moment. Is this. It's not about we building the incarceration okay. centers. It's about the rehabilitation Fisher. correctional plan. It's a whole chain. And we are putting incarceration at the front rather than at the last resort. Mm. And that is where we've gotten it wrong. Valid and points. the Bona Ahmed Tinubu's administration is about reversing that trend. Thank and you. making sure that the proper chain is followed and adhered to in line with global best practice. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Let's uh, quickly pause for a break now. When we come back, the conversation continues. Stay with us. All right, thanks for staying with us. This is Good Morning Nigeria. We've been discussing the whole gamut of reforms uh, in the Ministry of Interior. But let me get to the Controller General of Immigration now. Well, we've seen 
e-gates, we've seen e-borders. I've also heard people say it's all a fizzy. But how effective, what has changed in terms of border security, border management since the installation of e-gates, e-borders? Thank you very much. Um, you know, initially, what we had was just lines across the borders where people just come in and we take your details and everything. But now we have a border management information system, the MIDAS, where before you come in, we take your biometrics and, you know, we profile you and you come in. And then again, we've taken it a step further where we have all, our, most of, let me not say all, but over a hundred crossing points now, we have our IVS, which is the intelligent video system. What that does is some kilometers before you coming in, these are the land borders, of course, you're recorded, you, you know, we see who's coming in, who's not coming in. So that's one system and it's linked directly to our command and control at the service headquarters. So what that does is we have real time information 24 seven every day of whoever is coming in or going out of our borders. So that is a whole different level in terms of border control. And then we go to the e-gate. The e-gate is a system where whether Nigerian or non-Nigerian you come in, you have to scan your passport and it's linked to a database at the control and co a command and control center at the head service headquarters, being monitored day and night, every day, 24 seven. And we also have the API and the PNR. That does, what that does is that we pull information from the airlines before passengers even board. It's an interactive uh, system where before you even come into the country, we know who's coming in. So if we know that you're a person of interest or we know that you're a person who is suspicious or who has um, a funny, funny attitude or we don't want, you know, or you're a person of interest, let me just use that word. Then we don't, we let the airline know that this person is not allowed to board, is not allowed to come into the country. So we have that, we pre-profile pre passengers before they even come into the country. So that's another level in terms of border control, in terms of border governance. So we are not just knowing who's coming in, but we have the ability to say, listen, this person is a person of interest, or this person is wanted in this, in this place or this country, so do not, or we even look at travel plans as well, travel history. Where has he been to? Has he, you know, people coming from Brazil or from Colombia, you know that there's a pattern there. So we also have the, uh, the ability to check your travel pattern. Mm -hmm. So that is what we're doing now. That is the system we have now, the border information system. Is the command and control center functional assets today, though? 123 trained. Yes. Are they posted? Are they deployed? And is the command and control center up and running? Up and running, not yet, in a couple of weeks. Because first of all, before you man such things, you must train them properly. These are data analysts. They must know how to inform uh, how to you know read the information. How do you know what to escalate? How do you know where to direct information to? So these are the training that's going on. We inducted about 123 officers yesterday. And they're going to the next phase of, of training, which is done by in conjunction with ICAO and IATA and, IATA and other you know, agencies. So this is what's going on right now. And the training is going to go on for another week or two weeks. And then hopefully then we start, we, we become right. operational. Thank in, you very much, yes. uh, Comptroller General uh, Kemi Nandap, uh, for, for your response to that question. But uh, I want to get back to Dr. Agomo now because the correctional um, uh, uh, centers, uh, facilities, you know, seem to have um, quite a number of issues and uh, the immigration seems to be a bit settled, you know, uh, in, in, in the whole ministry. Uh, 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 yeah, so we hope the correction, <laughs> I mean, the minister has promised us it's going to be settled. So yeah, don't worry. In, in talking about settling the correctional facility, I still want, uh, want you to let us know what it's like, you know, for the image. You talked about the feeding, the maltreatment and all of that, but what about medical facility? Are there medical facilities in in, yes. in correctional, hold on, just a minute. Uh, are there medical facilities, you know, that can cater, um, you know, you know, for the, the needs of these inmates medically? Because, I, I mean, I've seen reports of people who are being freed or granted bail for medical reasons. So I, I'm wondering if there's a medical facility that is up and running in the, in the centers. I mean, they should, be, they should be taken care of uh, in there. That's one. Then two, we're talking about the overcrowding issue. At the moment, yeah. as of September, the report says that 3,590 inmates are on death row in the country. 
3,590. That's a huge number. The last time an execution was carried out or a death warrant was carried out for the execution of an inmate on death row was in 2016. And that was by the former governor of Edo State. 2016, this 2024. It looks like the governors are not willing to sign the death warrants of these inmates. Should there be another way out? Because, I mean, this is another form of, you know, keeping people there and, 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 you know, complicating issues uh, for, the, for the correctional facilities. I, I want to hear your take. Okay, so there are two issues you brought to the table now. One is about medical, the other one is about death row. I will, I'm going to speak on, on both. So first, in terms of the medical, uh, most, I'm sure that I, I wouldn't be wrong to say almost every or the greatest and a lot of the correctional centers do have sick bills, yeah? So it's, it's, you do have the facilities. Are there facilities? Are there they personnel? Need, they need have, sometimes, you know, they, sometimes you have a clinic, sometimes you have, it's of course of different grades, of different uh, um, uh, uh, structure. And then of course, you know, it's something to have a facility, but it's also a different thing to have all of the appropriate drugs that you require, all of the appropriate uh, specialization in terms of medical that you require. So there are facilities that you have that are clinics, now, the question, therefore, is that what are the services that are able to be provided in those facilities? Um, there are also some few correctional centers that have um, almost like an little bit upgraded, uh, you know, I don't know what I, I could, at least almost like a upgraded hospital. There are not many of them. But the point I want us to see, it's, it can always be improved on. There are a lot of inmates, if you talk about number, you know, that's why the issue of number is always a big issue. Because no matter what you are providing, if you over, um, overstretch because of number, it becomes a problem. The second thing is the how many of the professionals are you attracting into the service? How much of the appropriate drugs do you, those persons have access to? You know, And this is also another opportunity, and I'm going to use this opportunity really to call out to you know, almost different professional groupings, clinical psychologists, medical doctors, med psychiatrists, um, uh, you know, um, different other professions, they can begin to look at, especially in the medical space, yeah, begin to look at what can be done to provide service. I'll give you one just example. Let's talk about mental health. Section 24 of the Nigeria Correctional Service Act of 2019 talks about mental health review board. And this is because the, mental, the regime that is running the mental a, a, a health processing of inmates is based on lunacy law the olden days but the national correctional service of 20, uh, 2019 came in to bring some levels of reform around it members of the mental health review board was at least i believe inaugurated virtually on the 25th of august 2022 but haven't been able to begin to implement that rule so the question, therefore, is, and you know, in terms of mental health, and I want to say this, apart from the fact that there are some facilities that have asylums, you find that you don't have appropriate um, professionals to deal with that. Have appropriate training for correctional officers in terms of handling mental health. Though there is now a protocol, but it needs to be fully entrenched. So the question is that, is it possible that those who are professionals within the mental health space, uh, National Association of Clinical Psychologists, Association of... Um, uh, psychiatrists in Nigeria and all of that to come to an end because every place where you have the correctional centers there will be their members is there something that can be worked around that and that could be other things so the response to your issue on medical is that a lot still needs to be done around that space to ensure that we have proper access to health for every inmate proper access and that the appropriate drugs and all the rest of that happens to be provided and again that's part of what the minister was also talking about the holistic reform area that's also one area that will also be looked at okay this so on the death row yeah that's another thing i want to talk to about the question about death row first of all you need to understand that there is a u.n moratorium on death executions on executions hmm? the point and what he has said is that countries should not execute and there is a reason for that we have found a lot of errors, even in countries like the United States. They found that with DNA, a lot of people who you have found to be guilty and had killed, they found out that they did people were innocent. More so, the kind of system that we have. So, when you find persons who you put in death row, what we have currently is that you have a process whereby, for example, through the prerogative of mercy, 
committees, both at the presidential committee on prerogative of mercy and the state committees on prerogative of mercy. Sometimes people who are on death row can be reviewed. Depending on the situation, they may be put to be a lifer. Okay? Because if somebody is a lifer, it's actually easier. You're not killing the person until the way the person is, you know, unless another process comes and the person is able to get out, depending on if the criteria the person have met. So it is not something right for Nigeria to be executing. And this is key. If because of that monitoring and because of the fact that a lot of the errors have been made. So I think that when we're looking at the, reducing the number of persons who are in custody, the question is not about going to kill them. It's about life. What of the people where you find that error? And there have been a lot, a lot coming out of that space. So what we need to do is a question of being able to look at all of the cases, including the cases that are death row, what are those ones that are qualified to be lifers and the rest of that? And this is really the point I would, I'm going to make at this particular moment. Because we have found that countries that have capitalization, when you say capitalization, that's the countries that are currently executing people. It has not reduced the severity of certain offenses in terms of those countries. So it doesn't make it easier for that country. Rather, the other way around. Yeah, in right. other words, it shouldn't be the way to go. Not at no, least, not awful. Not, 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 not to kill. No, no. Not, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that Nigeria. I'm sure. I'm sure that's why the governors, you know, of course, don't want to sign all of that. But I, I think you have you have made a good recommendation. I'd like to get to the honourable minister now, and I want you to look at the fire service. Like the immigration, I said earlier, immigration, of course, uh, seems to be uh, standing on four legs. Uh, <laughs> the correctional service, maybe two legs. <laughs> the fire service, maybe no leg at all. Uh, so I, I want you to, to tell, you know, that I, I hear that there's this, uh, uh, you're trying to, um, there's a new, you want to do something about the Act of 1963? So, so tell us about, you know, what, what your reforms are in, in the uh, Nigerian fire service. Because, I mean, a lot of Nigerians, many do not even know that it still exists based on well, how it functions. Thank you. Um, so first thing about fire service is um, we have to understand that that act, uh, I mean, it's an act of 1963, you know, and uh, it's, it's about fire service. And I sincerely believe it should be fire and rescue service because all over the world, rescue is at the center of it. Fire service all over the world is not But the Senate is kicking against that, that change, right? No, I don't think so. Okay. I, I'm not, not to the best of my knowledge, not to my knowledge. Because it's it's the convention all over the world. For instance, I was in Medjugorje during the I mean during the flood, and I didn't see. And I told the CG fire, I didn't see fire service officers rescuing people. When you go to the UK, when there is hurricane, there is flood, there is f whatever. It's the fire service that you see, you know, um, rescuing people, emergency medical services, EMS is a function of fire service, you know. So there's a lot. We're trying to reform that in line with global best practice. But someone will want to question and all of that reform because now that it is just the fire service, we, we don't see its capacity. We don't see. No, what, you, what, you, you so see, now when you you, when you cannot add you cannot because. A child is finding if a child is finding it difficult to talk, assume that a child should never talk. All right? You can't assume so that they're struggling at the moment does not mean that with the right reforms. It, that is the essence of reform. And to the best of my knowledge, Nigeria is a country of optimists, or not a country of pessimists. So pessimism is not in the dictionary of Nigerians. So for me, we're optimistic people. This is something that must work. This is an agency that affects me. This is an agency that affects you, okay, that affects all Nigerians. So we want the fire service. The act needs to be repealed, not even amended. Repealed and, I mean, enacted. We need to enact a new fire and service, uh, fire and rescue service act. That's number one. And number two thing is the way, another thing we saw is that we got to the fire academy. It was nothing to write home about. And today, if you go there in Shedda, you'll see massive construction work going on. Within the next one year, we're going to be done, and we're creating the best, and I'm telling you, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of facility, in ter we're creating the best fire academy we have in West Africa, right there. Because the era when you see private organizations, some oil and gas companies, banks, and etc., sending their officers abroad for firefighting and rescue training, we think that money should be here. You know, we should be able to retain such funds here. We should create an academy. And Next week, we're going to be in the, in the UK. We'll have uh, on the invitation of the Home Office in the UK. And we're going to, we're collaborating with the fire, 
service in the UK will be in, uh, will be uh, will be in Liverpool. Uh, the what they call National Resilience Centre of Excellence in Liverpool will be on Motor March, which is the Fire Academy. So we are also obviously forming that level of partnership with the United Kingdom to be able to build a fire and rescue service that Nigerians will be proud of. And also another thing that's also important that we're working on. It's even the communication, something as basic as communication. Nigerians, once there's an emergency, Nigerians should be able to get in touch with fire service like now. You know, there must be dedicated, not just dedicated, like there must be that toll easy toll-free access. So we're trying to work on, on this. So that be, and of, obviously the response system. And I have also told them that in terms of their expenditure, they really need to sit down and look at what's done all over the world. Today now, with certain minor drones, you know, and with payloads, a lot of uh, what's it called? Uh, firefighting is done all over the world. We have to look at technology in that regard. And one other thing that is very critical that I think we need, uh, it's the issue of opening up the space for private sector participation. Let's be objective about it. We cannot, government alone cannot be in charge of firefighting. You can't be the only provider of solution. We must open the space for the private sector to participate. Why did I say that? I'll give you an example. When you go to the banks, you see um, you see security officers. It's not every day that armed robbers will come to the bank. But we, I, but there is there are security officers there to private make security. Security. yes, because you're trying to be proactive, you know. But when you go to most of our commercial centers in Nigeria, you do not see any officer that is even trained, that is even a firefight, fire and rescue service officer. That's why, for instance, give me a reason why you put 100 people, 200 people, you run hotels or you run um, commercial activities. And you do not even have somebody that is trained, not just on firefighting, but even on rescue and emergency service management. If somebody faints, you, you saw what happened during the ministerial screen National Assembly when one of our colleagues fainted. You know, at that particular point in time, he could have died. When I was chairman of NDDC and there was the probe, I could remember that Professor Ponde fainted, you know, and had to be rushed to hospital. That is because the National Assembly Hospital was nearby. Just assume that the hospital is not, you know, like it's a market, like Wuse Market or Balogun Market or somewhere. So we sincerely think that we must be proactive. We must see life, saving of life must be a priority you understand and in doing that it's not to me the best doctor is not a man who treats an ailment but a man who helps you to prevent an ailment so we as government we have to be proactive and that's what we're trying to do so how do we open the space how do we now allow nigerians to be able to run uh, what we call, uh, I mean, fire service should be the responsibility of fire service in real sense. They should be regulators of the industry, but the law does not give them that power yet. That's why they cannot regulate. The fire service should also be a trainer because what fire service should do is to train people on firefighting, on emergency management, on rescue, on med train people, and these people, and you certify them, you know, as professionals. Then banks, uh, markets, malls, um, hospitals, and we now recruit these people. By doing that, you also create a job. You create a new line of career. You understand? So we believe that there is a lot to be done. We're choking the economy. We're choking the whole system instead of us opening up new career opportunities for people. And, and the fire we, academy? Yeah. And it, that's it, why it, we're building the fire academy now. And our plan is within the next one month, I want to thank Mr. President for supporting us to build the fire academy. I tell you, when we give our word, we keep it. In the next one year, rather, we will be commissioning the fire academy. Okay. And once we finish that, that's the national. We hope to be able to replicate that, at least for yes, now, yes. in every region. Mm -hmm. You know, once we do it with six in every region, make it seven, then we'll start with, till we get to every state, such that, because the, the, imagine the number, let me give you an instance before I go. Imagine the number of jobs we can create. Realistically, consider the number of non-resident um, uh, non-residential buildings we have in Nigeria. Imagine the number of markets we have in Nigeria. Imagine the number of banks, schools, churches, uh, companies, and all these commercial ventures. You cannot tell me to come lodge in your hotel. When, uh, you, uh, if anything happens to me in the middle of the night, there's nobody that can provide Rescue. that. 
mm. immediate as that's what fire service should do so that's why it's called it should be called fire and rescue well we believe that this will create jobs not just create jobs, create a new career path and but what's holding that up you are a lawmaker and so it's, it should be easier for you to navigate no, that's the, the already, process. I, and i have to tell you we've been getting great support from the national assembly we hope that once we are able to let me just say this before we go and it's very critical i say this you see by repealing and enacting a new fire and rescue service act i tell you it will be like opening of the gate for the whole process because you are only as strong as the law wants you to be strong and okay. you are who the law says you are even if today the fire service wants to work, the law has not given has restricted them. it. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, we do sincerely appreciate it. But unfortunately, we're out of time. You know, it looks like we're going to have you come again, you know, very soon. We, we so haven't talked about the NSCDC, by and the way. Exactly. <laughs> the NSCDC is there. And, and really, I would have loved to ask this, the, the CG uh, what she's doing, you know, to deal with those who are corrupt within the service. Because, you know, uh, all the reforms, you know, what you're doing as CG, what the minister is doing. But it looks like there's still some bad eggs, you know, trying to give uh, the immigration Just service. Like you always uh, have anyone <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, but, but at least you need to reduce them to the barest minimum. So I'm sure you're looking in that uh, uh, regard and, Absolutely. of course, uh, you know, give uh, your service a clean name, mm -hmm. just like the clean name of the Honorable Minister of, <laughs> of, of Interior, Olubimiti and Jojo. Always a pleasure to have you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much. Looking forward to having, you know, more engagement with you. Very insightful. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Uh, also, the uh, Controller General, Nigeria Immigration Service, Kemi Nana Nanda. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you. Uh, wish you all the best. And, of course, uh, we hope that the immigration service will continue to do great like it's doing at the moment. Absolutely. Dr. Oju Agomo, Executive Director, Prisoners Rehabilitation and Welfare Action, Power. Congratulations, 30 years, you say. Uh, we rejoice with you. Uh, of course, uh, Member United Nations Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, Associate Professor of Criminology and Security Studies, Chris Land University of Bogota. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you. And uh, continue the good work that you're doing. We Thank hope our you. correctional service uh, becomes uh, very correct, like they say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm Ian Ray John. That's our package this uh, Tuesday. Remain tuned to the NTA. All right, and I'm Victor. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Let's keep the date. <laughs>